This video is made possible by Practical Defense Systems, the best online security training at the lowest prices. You can start your security career today online at pdsclasses.com. Check them out. Hi, I'm Joel Persinger. I'm the Gun Guy. Thank you very much for all of your support and everything you do to keep Gun Guy TV crew going. I'm very, very grateful. Merry Christmas to you. I hope you're having a wonderful holiday season, and I hope you have a great Christmas. That's coming up soon. We're going to talk with Rick Travis here in just a minute from the California Rifle and Pistol Association because, yes, as expected, California is at it again. They're coming up with new gun control bills, but this time around, we're on offense, and I can tell you that Rick Travis is very confident that every last one of these things is going to go down in flames. He's going to explain them to us in just a moment. But before we do that, let me remind you that you can listen to the Gun Guy TV Firearms Podcast, which comes out twice a month, on your favorite podcast player, or you can watch the video version on Rumble. And if you wouldn't mind checking out these other video locations, that would be great, since sometimes YouTube does delete a video. Rumble, some of the other ones are great. So check them out and at least subscribe to one so that if you can't see a video on YouTube, you will be able to find it in those other platforms. Lastly, if you would like to support Gun Guy TV, the best way to do it would be to do so on Gun Guy TV Crew. Become a member. Join today because then you're going to get access to all the exclusive content I produce. Uh, sometimes every day, but at least several times a week, along with access to me. If you want to chase me down and ask me questions or pummel me with stuff or whatever, you're welcome to do that on Gun Guy TV Crew. You can find it at GunGuyTVCrew.com, or you can find it also on Locals or Patreon if you're on either of those platforms already. All right, let's go talk to Rick. Hey, Rick, thanks very much for joining me this morning. I appreciate it. I realize we've got uh, lots to talk about. The legislature never stops. Good night. So I have entitled this New California Gun Control Laws Proposed. That doesn't mean they're going to make it. Nope. It doesn't mean we're not going to win. It just means that the legislature is always trying to take another swing at something. What are they taking a swing at now? Well, Joel, as you know, um, usually this is the time of the year where, not that we ever go to sleep, but we get to a little bit of a reprieve, a little bit of a rest because it's the holidays. And the only thing the legislature does this time of the year is come back for that first week of December, um, which is this week. And it's normally just swearing into the new people that won the recent election, you know, which happens every other year. And then it, it's basically to sign who's going to have what office in the building and who's going to be in leadership positions. That is what is normal. What is not normal is having a special session that anybody paying any attention to the news would know that the governor said was to deal with the high prices of gasoline. And yet, in the first 100 bills between the Senate and Assembly that were introduced as, oh wait, yes, introduced this week, normally not introduced till the second or third week of January, so full over six weeks ahead of schedule, they started introducing bills and they're being very creative about it. And that's one of the things I wanted to point out at this early stage, because normally when a bill gets introduced, it has a thing called bill language. Which, which means it actually how. tells you what it is, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, as opposed to just a title and off we go. <laughs> but what they've done now is given titles, given where they're pulling this information, um, literally out of their rear end to be polite, and then what their intentions are. Like, knowing that they brought a bill wouldn't show you that they had an intent to pass a bill, but, you know, they've got to they've got to say it. And so, it's very interesting to me that, like I said, when you call for a gasoline fix in the state of California, and you have maybe five bills on that, and everything else is on, well, everything else. And we got stuck in that pile. So I want to. Well, of course. Now, wait a minute. Are you confused? Why are you confused about this? Don't you realize that guns cause gasoline prices to go higher? Don't you realize that ammunition is making gasoline prices higher? Isn't it clear to you that the Second Amendment rights of Californians is what's causing everything to be more expensive? Well, I, I don't knew the understand. ammunition it had a link to the global warming. But, uh. <laughs> right, sure. Okay. <laughs> anyway, what are they proposing? So uh, the first ones out of the gate actually ended up, and I called it on your shows previously, the zombie bill. 
Um, in case people don't remember that was back in 2019, that was Assembly Bill 18 by Mark Levine, which was dealing with the firearms and ammunition excise tax. And well, we defeated it only to have it come back in 2021 as AB 1223, which was the exact same bill, defeated it again. And then as you said earlier this uh, fall, when Sam Predis of Gun Owners of California and myself had spent the entire last night of the session defeating two bills, that was Assembly Bill 1227. Yes. And then we went, Levine's gone. He's turned out. Yeah. Yay. Yeah, not so quick. His ghost is still wandering around the Capitol, yeah, so apparently. so Assemblyman Gabriel has decided to take up. <laughs> He's taken up the mantle thing. from Levine. Okay, great. Right. And yeah. so now we have Assembly Bill 28. Um, there's no real bill language, but he said, you know, it would impose various taxes. Get this, including taxes on the privilege of engaging in certain activities. What was that word? Privilege. Privilege. He's never read the Constitution, obviously, but okay. Correct. The privilege. Uh, so he's the knucklehead for, quotient is getting, is increasing. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, okay. So we're going to be able to defeat this. And like when I was talking with some of the other people, such as Sam, um, we're going to be able to defeat this. We're going to be able to tie it up if it did get passed in a courtroom very easily and, and knock it down. But yes, this is going to be an exercise that we get to do yet again. And so now the the next question, and uh, I, if if this is true, I will I will make sure we have a drum roll, please, for my handy dandy pre recorded live band. Is SB nine eighteen back in some other form? The oh, yes. the killer, well, uh, the the maker of all things and all places in California as sensitive places where you cannot carry a gun, even if you have a permit, has that come back? Yes. Okay, well then hold on. You've got to tell us about that. Drum roll, please. <laughs> yeah. All right, go. So, uh, we have now what is called, because it was a priority, Portentino, who had 918, yep. got Senate Bill 2. 2. <laughs> okay, wait, hold on. <laughs> I'm, I may not remember that number. 2. Okay, I got it. That's the one. It's back. So it is the second bill out of the seven. Which I'm... I'm terrified to ask what the first one is but that's okay and this uh basically talks about that existing law prohibits a person from carrying a concealed firearm or carrying a loaded firearm in public with the exception of a ccw and so they have come up with this diatribe of like literally 20 different studies that says that when people carry ccws crime increases domestic violence increases everything increases now, I, I am warming. curious about one thing, given the Getting fact that global warming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Given the fact that that has been proven false on this planet, mm -hmm. in innumerable ways, many, 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 many times, what what planet are those studies from? Because they're obviously not from planet Earth. They well, must and, and are not from Mars because we're not there yet. So, yeah, there's, a there's, lot of those studies are coming from. Uh, some diff different areas. Uh, one of them is, you know, we have a good friend, uh, Guy Smith, who runs Gun Facts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Guy's a great ally in this, but like he said, the, the first paper they cite, I'm reading his email because it was so great, is from the naughty research list, which is... <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, okay. <laughs> it's from Planet X. Okay. Right. Oh, this is the research list that guy keeps going for us of all the papers that have been called out having been in grad school worked in a, in a university setting i can tell you right now lots of papers get written yeah. not many get peer reviewed and even less get published right. so to get one across the board is great a good grad student a good professor net researcher never ever looks at those first two categories that gets knocked out to cite in anything because it's junk. It's junk. Yet, the naughty list of reports cited are things that never passed peer review. and it Never got, got published. published. <laughs> if they got published, they got published like in the penny saver, not in an actual journal. <laughs> um, and of course, we all look to the penny saver for all of our, yeah. our outstanding research. So... You know, why are we laughing about this? You're, you're probably getting frustrated that Rick and I are laughing about this. We're laughing about this because it's 
laughable. You know, when after Bruin now, and after these other decisions, if this is the best they can come up with, we're in, we're in not in great shape, but we're in better shape than we were before. So hang in there. Anyway, Rick, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. Yeah, so no, I mean, you know, one of the things that we were talking about yesterday, and I, I'm going to do so, um, their approach on the far left to try to come with statistics that they can use is to use ones that don't exist. And while that sounds like I'm being funny, this is what they do. They devise a model state whose outcome is predicted by a mathematical model that employs assumptions about cause and effect that often come from other papers of inaccurate conclusions. Okay, hold on. So let's take that one at a time. They, div- they, they imagine, they devise, they come up with a mythical state. Correct. Okay, what was the second? That's, one, that's step one. What's the second then, step? They, pre- they only use outcomes that are predicted by a mathematical model. Okay, so they, use a, they come up with a mythical state. They use a mathematical model. Anybody who's ever had anything to do with mathematical models. I didn't do math in college, but I did get through calculus in school. Anybody who has anything to do with math understands that if you put garbage in, you get garbage out. So math doesn't prove anything unless what you input into it is actually valid or seems to be valid in the first place. So they use a mythical mathematical model plugging in garbage in the front. So we started off with a myth, and now we're into a math myth. We have a state myth. We're now into a math myth. What was three? That employs assumptions about cause and effect. Oh, so we we get to assume. Now, anybody who has a brain knows that when you assume, you make an ass out of you and me. Okay, right. so now we've got a third myth. So we've got myth, myth, myth. What's left? That often come from other papers outside of that one that have inaccurate conclusions. Oh, okay. So we have inaccurate. Well, how did they get to be inaccurate? It's because they're written by people who have a, a decision. They have a conclusion in mind and they write the paper to fit the conclusion. And so, so in other words, it's baked in, baked in conclusions. So hold on. You got uh, basically you have now research studies the left is using based upon starting with a foundation of a mythical state built upon mythical math where they assume whatever conclusion they want to begin with and then try to support it by writing a paper that supports the conclusion they came to by using three myths. Right. And I just thought we'd that. rip that to shreds while we had the opportunity. So there you are. Okay, so we did. <laughs> Go ahead. And just to give you an example of it, Several of them are, are claiming statistics, a lot of them given to them by groups like Moms of Demand Action and, and others, yeah. which is not a surprise. No. But in this country, despite what you may feel of their field operations, the most robust crime data collection is without a doubt the FBI's UCR database, which keeps all the crime stats. They invent crime stats that fly in the face of that. I mean, literally that system is based on, anybody that's worked in law enforcement knows, you arrest someone for murder, they're prosecuted for murder, you get all the data, that goes to them, it gets sorted and it tells you, this is how many people use this widget to take someone's life in this state. Those are inarguable facts. That is like what's been proven. Yet these studies are like, oh no, 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 ignore that. We don't want to look at the facts, and then they create this myth that we just talked about and say, these are the statistics. So even though the UCR from the FBI shows that when people carry a firearm, they don't do all the bad things that the left tries to claim. In fact, there's a lot of positives that come out of that. The left's like, no, 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 that doesn't fit our narrative. So, um, <clears throat> any any way to lie, cheat, and obfuscate. Boy, did I say that r- word right? Obfuscate. That's a good word. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to use that this morning. I appreciate it. So if you're watching this, don't worry. Uh, Rick, Sam, and their teams are all over this. And uh, <laughs> by the way, I should mention too. Let me let me make sure I ask about this bill. Now that we've completely ripped their whole mindset to shreds, which wasn't particularly easy and i want you to know if you're watching this we weren't we didn't talk about this ahead of time we just ripped it to shreds on the fly so if it can be ripped to shreds on the fly chuck michelle will tear it to shreds in court uh in in great detail 
the when they tried to pass this as SB 918 and restrict everything, now this is my understanding, wasn't that done in such a way that it was going to be effective the minute the governor signed it? Correct. But that's not the case here. No. So because, what's what's the difference then? So when you do it with what's called an urgency clause, that requires more than two thirds of the House to pass it so it can go to the governor's desk. They learned their lesson because both with the previous bill, which was 1227, which is now Assembly Bill, I want to make because we just got these, 28, and with what was formerly 918, which is now SB2, we were able to defeat those because they couldn't get the two thirds. So they removed the two thirds, which means that if this passed this, this year and was signed by the governor, it wouldn't take place till January of 24. Has anything changed in the street? Now, we had the election, okay? Mm-hmm. And I realized that in California, you know, you, p- people think their votes mean nothing. That's not true, but they do think that. And I can fully understand why. I have to fight back that thought on a regular basis pretty much after every election and beat, to beat that thought into submission and explain to my, myself the facts. So I get it. What has changed, if anything, um, that helps us in this legislature this time around? There's a few things that have changed. It's going to be interesting to see how the assembly actually opens up and in the Senate, but especially the assembly. We have a race that is yet to be called as of us talking right now, which is, I believe, the 47th district. Um, that race was less than 100 votes separating them. And what we found this time in this election session was we had many, many races that are not red or blue. They're purple. And purple meaning like less than 1,500 votes separating the two candidates. And so that has caused the left to go, wow, we have some vulnerabilities. Um, We did have a lot more people coalesce and get out and vote. Um, I think one of the concerns is just to see, like even in Georgia, if you don't get everybody out even on a second attempt, that can hurt you. Um, It definitely did Mr. Walker. But looking at... Uh, what's going on in California. I think we have some people that are going to be a little reticent jumping all in on several different platforms, firearms being one of them, because they're already running for re-election. And so they're going to tread carefully. And that's why it's so important that we get people in field offices saying, no, 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 no. I'm watching. Don't do this. Um, Because that's going to have a major play to it. It's why our chapter program throughout the state is applying a lot of pressure. We have a a wonderful group of people that um, are a call to action group that will call in to the legislature during testimony and stuff and get quite a few people. We've literally had over 100 people calling in during testimony um, and providing that of why these, these different bills are not right and violate the constitution. We also have another thing. Uh, California's in a $25 billion deficit. And for some of these bills that enacted, it takes money. And so yeah. economics becomes a big deal because you got to realize some of these politicians have pet projects that actually got them elected. You know, most of them did not get elected on a stance one way or the other on the Second Amendment, but they did on the homeless issue or they may have got yeah. on, you know, an educational issue. Those things all cost money. And so when that person's up there trying to get their bill to deal with homeless in their area up and they need X millions of dollars. And then this cost X millions of dollars, and you have people like myself and Sam and others going, uh, you guys have to be cutting the budget. Where are you going to come with the money for this? That becomes a very powerful tool in this debate. So it sounds like we're not in rubber stamp land anymore. We, mm-hmm. There for a long time, it seemed like every gun bill was a rubber stamp. I mean, it just blasted through the legislature because they had a two-thirds majority and the governor signed it. But that sounds like that's changed. That has changed. And the other part of this is you kind of realize um, – you know, it's an older movie. It's, you know, a lot of people I haven't seen more, but it was, uh, I want to say it was like The Dog Wags the Tail, something like that. But it was a political movie that came out about 15 years ago. And uh, I'm so curious now, I want to look that up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, uh, you know, one of the things that they showed uh, was how after a political speech, campaigns actually post people in the um, 
audience around the media to say the same thing like five different ways. And then the media would all of a sudden go, oh, this is our idea. And then they'd come back to the can and go, wouldn't you say exactly what the media, the polit- political people told the media to ask, and then it gave the right response, goes out to the masses, the masses buy it. The left has used this for a long time. Of, yeah. The vote doesn't count. This doesn't work. It's called Wag the Dog was the movie. Wag and the I'm Dog. Yes, I have that. seen it. It sounded really familiar. I saw it a yeah. long time ago. Yeah, I got and it. Okay. That is a good object lesson because that has been done a lot. I've seen on a couple of bills where staff came out and said, see, this is why you know, the vote doesn't count. Your vote doesn't count. Your vote doesn't count. And then me is like, well, wouldn't you say with a Democratic supermajority, if you're a Republican, your vote doesn't count? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I would say that. Okay, that's a self-created deal to suppress votes. Well, and I tell you, I, it, anybody as, living right now, sorry, but anybody living right now has to even from Elon Musk and Twitter. We see that the left has a, a, a great campaign to convince those on the right. They don't count. Well, I mean, and, and the ammunition there, the truth to demonstrate that that's actually false, is what you just described in a couple of these races. When you have right. a race that for legislature that is down to 100 votes oh my gosh your vote counts <laughs> right and when you yeah. have one down to 1500 votes your vote counts i mean my my I, i've told you many times my local mayor's been on my show he's a great guy bill wells and he's he won his race here in uh in this town and he didn't win it by you know a ton of votes but he he won it he was gonna win it it was obvious because he's very popular and people really like him for lots of reasons. But the point is that, I mean, when you look at the number of votes counted for a local mayor in smaller places, you, maybe you got 3,000 votes cast or 5,000 votes cast, which means your vote really counts. So this is when, you know, yeah, it might not count for president. I get it. But it counts for everything local or state quite a bit. I think we got to get out of that. Otherwise, why would you have a chapter program if votes didn't count? Otherwise, why would Rick Grinnell, God bless him, Ambassador Grinnell's busting his butt in every conceivable direction. He's got the organization uh, Fix California running around getting people registered to vote who are like minded. Why would he spend the time and energy doing that? That guy's so talented, it's ridiculous. He's got 50 million other things he could be doing, making millions of dollars. Instead, what is he doing? He's doing this. Why? Because votes count. And by the way, if you haven't looked at Fix California, I urge you to do so. So I, I think we got to get past that somehow. And all I can do is continue, as you and I have been doing for years now, beating that drum. And here's that race. That race update is in the 47th District. It's San Bernardino in Riverside County. It was Republican Greg Wallace versus Democrat Christy Hostledge, and Wallace won by 85 votes. <laughs> oh my gosh, 85. 85 votes. Now it's now somebody tell me your vote doesn't count in that district. Yeah, and it, right? it's a win, but any voter can request a recount, which would cost about $135,000. So I doubt a voter is going to do that, but still, it's 85 votes. 85 votes. I mean, this is how, and is this unusual? No, it happens, Sarah. I mean, when you get into political circles, it's not talked about a lot. And I guarantee you, like 90 days from now, no one will be talking about it. It will have been buried because nobody wants to do that. Because the obvious thing that happens is somebody like me walks in office and says, you don't have a mandate. Or that's, you know, if I don't want to vote a certain way, or if I do, this is your chance to make a name for yourself by doing this. So. Right. That's what moves forward. But, uh, yeah, there are a lot of elections that come down to less than a couple of hundred votes, which is why I, I talked on a, a different program to, a couple of days ago. Uh, many of the races in California at all levels came down to flipping a vote about every three track of homes. Oh, wow. Oh, so when wow. you think your voice yeah. to the people next door or your voice to your friends or family doesn't count. That is the biggest lie politically out there. Literally, the biggest. Wow. Well, okay, so are, you sound like you're feeling pretty confident about these new bills coming out that we have a shot at knocking these down. Is this, I mean, what, are your, what is your, I mean, if you were to put your finger to the wind, um, how many of these do you think actually pass? Or are right. there particular ones you think will pass that we get to kill later? Um, I think we're going to get about 30 bills. I think we'll be able to stop um, 
because we've done so many times the excise tax bill. I don't think a lot of people have the um, wherewithal to want to go apply a tax during these economic times. So I think that's going to be one that we can hold up uh, fairly easily. The uh, 918 now SB2 uh, going in the face of Bruin. I think we have a lot of strong argumentation based off the not one or two, but now numerous decisions across the country that have come down from district courts and, and you know state courts and everything in wake of Bruin is going to be big. This one's going to be a test though because going for that history, text, and tradition, both sides are going to be bringing a lot of information. And you got to remember it's got to be strategic because everybody's got about two minutes to testify. So it's got to be pointed quick, you know, a lot of groundwork. Um, and we're already working on it. And that's the thing that I think helps us out is you see right now, they kind of made a mistake in my book because it was a question mark for everybody. What were they going to do? While they got it out six, seven weeks early, they also gave us six to seven weeks of time to build. And we had already been building. We were already prepared that 918 made it across the Sioux. So a lot of the machinery behind this is already in place, already ready to go. So there's not a lot of the stress that would normally be on, like, if we can't stop this, how fast can the legal system be right behind us to nail it? That legal system's already ready to pull the trigger, no pun intended, tomorrow if they needed to. So, Which brings up um, another question, and I'm sorry I'm interrupting. I apologize. Well, one thing I wanted to ask you on the tax bill, is it true that whenever there's a tax bill, that requires a two-third majority, or am I wrong mm-hmm. about that? Okay, so that one, that's that's got a, a pretty good hurdle to try to get over the over the. Yeah, so how that works in the tax bill on a straight tax, on the two-thirds majority, on uh, applying an excise tax for a specific area does not require two-thirds. Oh, I see. Okay. But it does require uh, a few more votes within some of the committees to be moved out of committee. So that's a place that could get killed is in committee. And many, many, many bills die in committee. They never make it out. So uh, that's going to be our goal for Sam and I is to kill it in committee. Um, and we got a pretty good team of people that are coming alongside us to do that. And then we have, um, you know, already there's going to be a lot of bills that will come out. They're just right now what we call placeholders. But we have a couple other bills that are dealing with uh, increasing the, the number of years on a gun violence restraint order. So adding an additional three years to it. There's some domestic violence stuff that it, they're trying to um, apply firearms to. And that was one of the areas I wanted to touch lightly on is Obviously, CRPA, you know, Gun Owners of California, other groups that we work with um, are not pro-domestic violence. We're absolutely against that. What we're not in favor of is just because someone says you committed something until proven, you're still innocent. We believe in due process. And so to take everybody who gets accused, all of their firearms away, Often those firearms are sold before they ever get a court date. You can't get it back. And yeah, you know, you can make the argument, well, sure, you could go buy another Glock 17, but do you get back your dad's and grandfather's 1875 lever action rifle? Nope. Can't go buy that. So once it's gone, it's gone. And those are violations of your constitutional rights, and we are going to fight for those. So um, just understand that sometimes when we we take a stand, it's not on the big issue. It's on some of the technical issues that can impact all of us down the road. Well, and I don't want to sound, you know, (laughs) I'm going to make somebody mad. I guess what else is new, right? It's not, I'm going to say it, it's not unusual in a a, uh, divorce or a custody battle or any of those things for one side to claim domestic violence and use that as a weapon against the other side when in fact it never occurred and sometimes it does occur so it's a really tough thing to uh to it's a it's a fine line to walk do you allow people to just use that as a weapon and take away the constitutional rights of their opponent just because they say so or do you at the same time on the other hand risk the fact that they might be right and now that person still has the uh, the firearms. So I understand there's a really fine line there. But at the same time, 
there are mechanisms to figure this out which are not currently employed it's just a blanket thing you make the accusation all the firearms go away and that's got to change so i'm glad you're fighting for that are there yeah, any other bills that, i'm well, sorry yeah, go ahead i just wanted to touch base on that part of that as we saw last season and it was something that really frustrated uh, me quite a bit was there was a bill that we were able to defeat yay <laughs> But what the bill did was designed to do was to broaden the number of people that could claim that you were a threat. And amongst those were a spiritual leader that has ever met you. Was that the Hare Krishna guy at the, you know, because the definition of a spiritual leader depends on the group because they define that. Um, and how does somebody know just for because I walked by them who I am? It was anyone you had ever dated, ever. So, you know, if you're somebody like me at my age, before I got married to my wife, there was a few people. I mean, I am not wasn't a playboy or anything like that, but there were a few people. Plus, today, there's people consider, like back in the day, if I went with a girl to get a cup of coffee between classes at college, not a date. But today, you know, if somebody assumes that's a date, that's a date. And, you know, so we went through and had to, to pull that back, it was anybody that had ever been a teacher. Well, I don't know about you, Joel, but when I was in college, I had classes with 150 people in it. That teacher never knew who I was. I was a number. And oh, I, yeah, I took a I took a course in an auditorium. It was an, a, a cultural anthropology course. There were 300 people in the room. Yeah. I never, you know, I, you almost needed opera glasses to see the instructor at the bottom of the auditorium. That's and, crazy. Yeah. And they added to that that anybody who had ever been a fellow student. Oh, yeah, like there's 300 people in the room. Right. But they never defined it. You had to even physically be. So what if you were in the online? It, it was just ridiculous. Yeah, it's crazy. The number of people. And so that's why I need people to understand, too, is sometimes when they see us striking these things down and going after them, it's because it's just absurd of who they're trying to qualify as a person can make a judgment about who you are on the fly and file it incognito. Like, you should be able to face your accusers. Well, that actually is a constitutionally protected right. <laughs> That's part of due process, right? Okay, well, uh, look, I guess before we wrap up, I'm going to ask you if there's anything else you want to talk about. I do want to do this because this we've had a long road, you and I have gone down on this show talking about this stuff. You've been fighting this battle a long time, so have I. And for the many, many years we've been on defense, and it seems to me we're on offense now. What would you say to the average California gun owner about how what, how does it stand now, this fight? Where are we now? Should we be encouraged, discouraged? Encouraged, totally encouraged. And the reason I say that is because before, um, we didn't always have everything ready to repeal and repel anything we do. And we also have several bills that were finalizing with authors and realize that just because bills are going through now, this is going to be an ongoing process through the end of January. Uh, but we have several bills that are designed to expand our rights. Um, some of those may not get passed this first year, but realize the vast majority of firearms bills designed to take away our rights don't pass in the first time up. They take two or three rounds to try to get them across the border. And so do not be discouraged if you see a couple of bills that we come up with and say, well, Rick, you didn't get it across, so, you know, that was the equivalent of a fart in church. No, it's not, because it's going to come back, and it's going to come back, and we're going to keep pushing back. We have changed our posture and our footing, and we are taking steps forward. We're not holding the line anymore. Well, and you mentioned something that may support us a lot, and that is case law after Bruin. Uh -huh. And I wonder if people are aware of the fact that we've been winning across everywhere. the country, everywhere. And can you give us one or two examples of that? I can give you an example that just happened yesterday, and that was in Oregon by a very thin margin of less than a percentage point. Measure 114 went through that would require background checks, a lot of stuff similar to what we already experienced here in California, but also would limit, despite you know, Judge Benitez's ruling down in the Supreme Court kicking it back saying, yeah, we kind of agree, and that would be in the uh, Duncan case on the limiting magazines to you know, 10 rounds or less, they passed the law to try to do it that way. Obviously, California is watching how that process is. And the Oregon Supreme Court said, yeah, no, that law is not going to affect. It's not constitutional. You can't do it. We don't care the people voted for it. And it's based off of the Bruin decision. And so 
that is a great border right next to our border. Look at it. Um, there's several other places in Illinois and uh, back east that we keep seeing place after place where Bruin is being cited and judges are saying, no, you can't do it. And so uh, we also see places like New York where the governor keeps trying to find creative ways to come up with another way around Bruin and keeps getting slapped back down. So I think we're going <laughs> to yeah. see a bit of that. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if our governor tries out a couple different ways. I think Senate Bill 2 is an attempt at that. And uh, it's, it's going to be a bloodbath. It's going to be um, a, a hard-fought road here in the uh, legislative fight. And if it does find a way to break free and get out, Chuck Michelle and his lawyers are already ready and prepped for it. And they're watching everything that we're doing inside the legislature to stop it. And that will all become, you know, all that testimony will become part of the court cases. And that's what a lot of you have to realize is that as we've built up a really strong lobbying alliance team, that team of people allows us to get things in testimony that even if we're not able to stop in the legislature, sets the ball forward for Chuck Michelle, who I know you're going to be talking to you later this week. He will tell you, yeah, we, we kind of set it all up and then they spike it to use the volleyball m- metaphor. So, yeah, I think these are Chuck said to me, you know, he and Stephen Hallbrook both. Uh-huh. Um, said on my show when the Bruin case made it to the Supreme Court that if the Supreme Court settled Bruin the way we thought and if they dealt with the with the text history and tradition issue that this might represent a hard reset Uh on the Second Amendment and I think about their prediction a lot because I think that's precisely what has happened now we have to fight for it Uh But the fact that we're winning in a lot of places can't be missed. We've got to be able to focus on that because we're going to we're going to suffer some temporary defeats along the way as well. But even with New York doing what they're doing and and Newsom may try these things. My thought is that every time they try one of these things and fail, that's one more bit of case law or one more example of what doesn't work. Uh, Even the case law around the country. And, you know, I'll talk with Chuck about that more uh, tomorrow. But. Even the case law around the country can be cited as, gee, you know, you, you guys want to try this, but this was tried over here and it doesn't work. Right. And perhaps that's one more arrow in our quiver as we move forward. Oh, it's definitely an arrow in our quiver. I think what people at the lay level have to look at, because sometimes um, even with the amount of years Chuck and I have been friends and colleagues and worked together, there are times I look at him when he's doing the legal speak of like, could you say that in English? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. But one of the one of the things that i think is a very good analogy is when any major sport comes up with a new rule there are those that go on the field and live by that new rule and there are those that go on the field and say okay that's the new rule but they try to find creative ways around it and until the referees and and the league penalize enough people for doing that then the rule becomes normalized we're in that stage where the rule has been set by Bruin. We have some people that are complying and going, okay, that's the Second Amendment now. And we have some people that are those ignorant slobs on the field that are trying to find creative ways around it. And this is where the courts are having to come back in and penalize them. And, uh, you know, whether it's that or like what we're trying to do to fight back on the, the CCW breach and getting people out there, um, which I know Chuck's going to talk about tomorrow, but getting people to fill out those forms, we could cost the state $300 million collectively as gun owners. And that would be a penalty to them. And we've got to start penalizing them when they put their hands in the cookie jar that they should have never been near. Uh, And that's a a very important form. So if I can, do you have a link to that on your page? Because I got an email from, got two or three like emails in a row saying, fill this out, fill this out. Um, so if you are interested in that and you would like to fill out the form so that you have the ability to sue the state, if you were one of the people who got got doxxed from that, I know I'm going to fill it out later on today when I get done teaching. You got to make sure that you fill that out. It preserves your ability to sue in the future. And it has to be done no later than December 20th, is my understanding. Right. So you want to get on it. If you're not receiving the updates from CRPA, absolutely go to the CRPA website and subscribe to those updates. And you would have gotten an email about that already. Rick, we're running out of time here, but I want to make sure that people at the same time know how to support the California Rifle and Pistol Association and support this effort because. 
I know it's Christmas and people are broke and things are tight and like that. But at the same time, we're in a position where now we're on offense and we're winning. Pulling back support is not going to help us. We need to have that support. How can they support CRPA? CRPA.org. Just go to the website. They can donate. They can join. They become a member. They can uh, go through the web pages, sign up to become part of a chapter. If there's not a chapter in the area, and we've had that happen because of this show and a couple other shows, we've set up chapters where a group of people said we would like a chapter in the area. We will do that. Yeah, very, very quickly, as a matter of fact. <laughs> so again, if you'd like to start a chapter, raise your hand and let CRPA know. Is there anything else we haven't talked about that we should? Not today. I think we've covered it and we got the information out to people. And just know as we go into those holidays that you're well protected and we're staying on the front lines and we're busy 24-7 with you. Thank you very much, Rick. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Have a Merry Christmas. You too. Okay. Thank you again for listening and watching through the entire interview. I'm super grateful that you did. I hope you have a wonderful Christmas. I know it, uh, money's tight and it's Christmas time and like that. But it, again, I want to remind you. Please help us out and join Gun Guy TV crew. You'll find it at GunGuyTVCrew.com. And please support the California Rifle and Pistol Association. We're on offense now, and they need every bit of support they can get from you, even if it's just joining a local chapter and being part of the fight. You'll find out more information about that at uh, CRPA. I will put a link in the description so that you can check it out more easily. Have a great week. Merry Christmas. And wherever you go, whatever you do, stay safe.